Your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. Our Old Testament uh, scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 14. And I think it's a, it's, it's a bit long. There's 31 verses, so I'm going to do my best to get through it. Um, but I think we need to, we need to be renewed in our, or be reminded of it. I'm, I know that we've all read it before, but we need to be reminded of what is going on in Exodus 14 because Paul does refer to it in our New Testament text. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may turn and camp before Pi Haharith between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, and the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea of pi Haharith before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring up us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that they than, that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to, to the one, and it gave light by the night to the other, so that one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and the Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord, his servant Moses. Let us turn to the New Testament where we pick up 1 Corinthians 10. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 5, but focusing on verses 1 and 2 this evening. First Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the reminder that we need to run the race that's placed be- we've been placed or that's been placed before us and that we need to endeavor to run by faith, trusting in the Lord, not in the things that we do, not in the things that we have done, but our faith needs to remain in the Lord who placed us on this race, in this race. Lord, fill me with the Spirit to preach faithfully your word. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. When Paul reminded the Corinthians that we looked at last week, run in such a way that you may obtain the prize, he wasn't doing so simply to get them to persevere. He was also rebuking them, for they had fallen into the false notion that they had arrived and could live any way they chose to live. John Calvin points this out in the section of 1 Corinthians, under 1 Corinthians 10, and I was like wondering why he didn't say something like that earlier. But it makes sense where he's going now. Once you see that what Paul is doing is reminding them to run the race and not to forget that those who have been in the race have fallen and have been destroyed. Calvin puts it this way. The Corinthians grew wanton and gloried as if they had served out their time or at least had finished their course when they had scarcely left the starting point. You see, the Corinthians mistook the analogy that they should be using for the Christian life. They thought the analogy was the soldier in the battle who has won the victory, and now he can retire and go live his life the way he wants. That's the wrong analogy. That's why Paul brought up the analogy of running a race and not to stop, that we're not to ever end until we have been called home from glory. Since they had been saved, the Corinthians, since they had been saved and made it into the kingdom of God through the shed blood of Christ, they made the mistake of thinking that they had arrived. They made the mistake of thinking that there was nothing left for them to do. It kind of reminds us of that parable in Luke where Jesus is talking about the man says, I've got so much food. I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me just go ahead and tear down my barns and I'll build new ones and sit around and be fat, dumb and happy for the rest of my life. And then he says, but the Lord came and said to him, tonight you will owe your life. He couldn't do that at all. So what I think that Paul is kind of saying along with Christ is pointing to the picture that we are on a race. 
And we don't stop running that race until the Lord calls us home. In Paul's exhortation or rebuke, as in the previous verses, depending on how one looks at it, he is reminding us that we cannot stop running the race. It's not a short sprint. And that we are to run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. In faithfulness. In obedience. In thankfulness. I mean, you think about the Israelites. We already read tonight that they were complaining about the fact that they could have died back in Egypt if, he, if Moses had just left them alone. Do you realize what was going on there? The, the Israelites were saying, we prefer to be slaves to the Egyptians than we do to be free in Christ. To be free in Yahweh. That's what they were saying because they had come up with a little bit of a conflict. All right. So Paul, in his letter, is, is t- telling the Corinthians, you have not arrived yet. There's a danger of being like Lot's wife, looking back to Sodom and wanting, more, wanting it more than the Lord. The danger of losing the race is by giving up and leaving the faith. It's real. It's a real danger, and we all face it. We know this because it is in our text before us that Paul turns and reminds us of our fathers in the faith who were under the clouds and whose bodies were found in the wilderness. Paul is showing showing us that the Israelites had the same blessings of baptism and the same blessings of the Lord's Supper that we do. And while their form of their baptism and their supper was different, it was same in every other respect. They had the same advantages that we do. This is why Paul brings this up. He's trying to show the Corinthians that, look, they had the same advantages that you do. The same things that you do. And yet they still fell away. And the reason he's doing so is he's he's trying to show them you cannot rest or think that you have an advantage in the new covenant just because you have new covenant Lord's Supper. We do have an advantage, but that doesn't mean that we can quit running the race. Calvin writes, For they, the Israelites, were favored with the same benefits as we at at this day enjoy. There was a church of God among them, as there is this day among us. They had the same sacraments to be tokens to them of the grace of God. But on their abusing their privileges, they did not escape the judgment of God. Be afraid, therefore, for the same thing is impending over you. Paul gives us this example of those who fell away, who were not faithful, who were in the covenant, covenant keepers. Now this seems harsh, but let's remember what the Corinthians are guilty of so far. Just so far. First, they were guilty of being divisive. Remember they kept following under, I want to be under Apollos. Okay, no, 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 no. I want to be under the Apostle Paul. No, I want to be under Peter. Well, I, I, I following Christ alone, you know, and there's all this divisiveness. All right. That's contrary to the nature of the gospel. It's contrary to the nature of what Christ is doing. And and this is the problem that we're going to see over and over again as we continue to go through first Corinthians is the number of things that people will use first Corinthians for to become divisive. It's amazing. You can't do it. Okay, so they were guilty of being divisive and following up and making and becoming sectarian and following their own groups. And we cannot do that. And Paul rebukes them harshly for it. Second, they were also nonchalant towards the second, uh, the sexual immorality in the body of Christ. This was so serious that Paul thoroughly rebuked them from a distance. He rebuked them and he rebuked the man and said he needed to be cast out. It's called excommunication. And it means to cast someone out of out of the communion with the body and with the Lord so that in hopes that they will repent at the seriousness of their sin and come back to the Lord. But the other sin that the Corinthians were committing was eating with meat while at the pagan celebrations. Now, now. Heidi pointed out to me last week, I keep saying that the Jews didn't eat meat. They did eat meat. They ate lamb, okay? 
<laughs> Sorry, that's, that's from the joke, big fat Greek wedding or whatever. As, you know, I, oh, I'm a vegetarian, I don't eat meat. Okay, I'll make you lamb. All right, that was the joke. But the point is, what I was trying to say is they don't eat meat from the market. They wouldn't eat meat from the market because the mar- meat at the market had been used in the temple worship. So they wouldn't eat that. So that, I'm glad she pointed that out. I've embarrassed her even more now, so I'm moving on. All right, but they were eating meat with, at the pagan celebrations, and they thought they had the freedom to go there because they had because they knew that they were that, that the pagans were worshiping false gods. There were no gods at all, and so they thought, well, why can't we just go enjoy the meal, meal and enjoy the meeting and, and and do that? Because there were demons behind it, and it was true fellowship. It was for this third sin that Paul is really warning the body about. This is where he's going in this section, in chapter 10. In verse 14, it says very very simply, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That's the main sin that he's having to deal with here, is idolatry. In our day, this would be the same as a man going to a Masonic lodge and hanging out with Masons and brothers don't do it. All right, don't do it, okay? Uh, I know all of us have grandfathers and great-grandfathers who were 32nd degree Masons and stuff like that. No, it is, a, it is darkness. You might as well go ahead and hang out with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, all right? You're hanging out with someone who's in darkness. What does light have to do with darkness? None. The point is, is that it is idolatry that Paul is most concerned about. For it is idolatry is at the heart of all of their sins. Idolatry, in a sense, is removing Christ from the throne and placing ourselves there instead. This is why the writers in the New Testament warn us over and over again against idolatry. You know, we think that we don't have a problem with idolatry today. We do. It's just as real. I mean... We may not be putting up a silver statue of Buddha and falling down to it and rubbing his belly or anything, but there's still plenty of idolatry to go around. Our, our, our minds and hearts are capable of coming up with even worse things than that. So in our text, Paul is going to show that the Israelites were unfaithful and, and their unfaithfulness brought down God's wrath on them and he's doing this as a warning to us. It's a warning given to us because we too can be unfaithful and to bring down God's wrath upon ourselves. In other words, if you decide not to run the race and decide to walk away from the faith, do not be surprised if God brings down his judgment upon you, just as he did for those who lacked faith in the days of Moses. There are consequences for disobedience and unbelief and being faithless. So Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to become unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. Now, I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this, but I want you to note the all, all our fathers portion there. He's equating those Jews there as our fathers in the faith, showing the continuity between the Old Testament and the New. That's what he's saying. He's saying, calling them our fathers and reminding them that they have the same faith that we do when they were under the cloud. Well, what's the cloud? The the cloud was mentioned in first in Exodus 13, 21 and 22. And it said, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of the cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, so there was that cloud. That's the cloud he's referring to. And when Paul gives us this picture of being under the cloud, the text he is referring to is Exodus 13, but also Exodus 14. What took place before this was that there were the 10 plagues leveled in Egypt. There were 10 plagues that were brought out. And finally, the Passover came about 
uh, where those who took the blood and put the, put the blood of the lamb on, on their doorpost and the spirit passed over and killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, both the firstborn men and the firstborn of animals all across the thing. And at that point, that's when Pharaoh decides to let them go. So they were, in a physical sense, being redeemed. Okay, what does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be purchased out of slavery. That's the, that's the word. We, we think of that often, don't we? You know, you wanted, you know what, I was part of a church, I think it was called Redeemer, Christian Redeemer Fellowship or something like that. We put the word Redeemer in there because it, it has this wonderful language of Christ buying us out of slavery and bringing us into his kingdom. And so that's what they're doing. They're more in a physical sense than a spiritual. Yes, the spiritual reality was also there for those who believed. But most of them, for the the reality of it, the picture that we're giving is a physical redemption. They were slaves to the Egyptians. And Yahweh bought them out and brought them out of slavery. He paid the price for their salvation. So the word redeemed means it's wrapped up in this idea of slavery. And we have this beautiful picture of Yahweh's actions toward the Israelites. And that they were not just redeemed, but they were also given the victory that, of the battle that he won. Uh, Exodus twelve thirty six says, And the Lord has given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus... They plundered the Egyptians. It's as if they had fought the fight. God's grace to them was so abundant and so overflowing that they were able to plunder the Egyptians who had been holding them captive for how many hundreds of years? So they left, they left Egypt with their suitcases full. They had plenty of things. They had gold, they had silver. Of course, that gold is going to be ended up used for a meal after it's chopped up and boiled and uh, knocked out of the calf, the golden calf incidents, and they're going to be made to eat it with the water. But they, God blessed them more and abundantly, and they're taken out. And so when Paul says that, that you know, they're being taken out under this cloud, he is referring to this pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it's under this cloud that represents God with his people. It shows his protection for them. It is a reminder of the grace that they have received from the Father. Now, Paul doesn't just use the cloud in referring to the Israelites. He also refers to the reality that they passed through the Red Sea. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. It's a reference to Exodus 14, which we saw. So let's turn in your Bibles and and go back there and remember that part of what God is doing is making his name known to Pharaoh and to his people. And he's doing all of these miracles so that they know that he rules over all of creation. And Paul wants to remind the Corinthians that this God, their God, has already acted in history to bring about a people to himself. And these people, some of them were faithful. See the Levites. Keep reading, you'll find that out. But a lot of them were not. And so he's reminding the Corinthians, don't make this mistake. Let's look at Exodus 14 real quick. Just a few things, okay, that we want to see. Is that verse verse 1 and 2, is that God sovereignly and providentially puts them in a place where they'll be trapped. He does that. He moves them. It says, it says, now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi Hahirath between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. God knows that by moving them there, they're trapped. You ever think about that for a moment? That God oftentimes puts us in a place where we can't do anything. And we have to look to him. They can't do anything. They can't fight uh, 
the Egyptians, all right, they don't have chariots. They didn't take the chariots. I don't know why they didn't take the chariots when they left, but they didn't, all right? So they're there. They're stuck. And God's going to use that situation to be glorified. And then he talks about hardening the heart, all right? We already know that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God just adds to it, okay? He is the Yahweh over all creation, and he both freely hardened Pharaoh's heart, or let, let Pharaoh freely harden his own heart, and he hardened it as well. Why? Why have I done this? So that, that, so that they would end up saying, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. Pharaoh has learned nothing. This is, by the way, the, the worst trait of a bad leader. They learn nothing, okay? That, that was one of the mistakes of Hitler. He learned nothing in his, in his reign as uh, uh, Nazi terror king or whatever. Uh, but uh, The Fuhrer, I'm sorry, as the Fuhrer. Uh, the, the, you know, learned nothing the whole time. He thought he was right in everything he did. And Pharaoh is the same way. He learns nothing, okay? He just lost his firstborn in the Passover. He has not learned anything about God. We also see that the people were very afraid down in verse 11, um, verse 10. And it says, when the Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Guess who else is not learning on this whole event? It's not just Pharaoh. It's a good portion of the Egyptians. It's a good portion of the Egyptians. I mean, the Israelites, I'm sorry. A good portion of the Israelites are not learning. And so often, we're the same way. We get into a situation where we're not willing to trust the Lord and keep going and be faithful where He's called us to be. And Moses... Shows him compassion. He says, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This is true physical salvation that's going to bring about. He's going to, and it's like I said, it's pointing to our spiritual salvation as well. For the Egyptians who are coming, he, he says, you'll see them no more forever. That God is going to wipe them out. God is going to destroy them. Does God have the right to destroy the Egyptians? Absolutely. Absolutely. He says, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now, another thing that's interesting here is that God could have just done this, but God, or, but God told him, the Lord told Moses, said, raise up your arm with your rod over the sea. He wanted the people to see him raising up his arm and doing this with the Red Sea so that he know that they would know that he is acting, that God was doing this. I think there's probably more implications why he was raising his hands like he was, but I haven't figured it out yet. But I think it's it's interesting that he does that so they can physically see Moses doing that and the sea beginning to part. It, it, it was a miracle before them because he's having the sea open and it's going to be dry and they're going to go through it. Why? Why is he doing that? Verse 17, and I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. This is the Lord speaking again. And they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. He's letting them know these pagan worshipers, your gods are useless to you. I am the I am Yahweh. I am the one who was before who I am, the, you know, the Alpha and the Omega. I, I've existed always. And I'm God over you, too. Now, I love this part. It says, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and a pillar of cloud went before them and stood before them. What's he doing? 
Who is this angel of the Lord but Christ? He's a mediator for them. He's standing in between the Egyptians so the Egyptians can't attack them. He's moved in there protecting them just as He said He would. Showing them the protection. But He's also dividing, and and this is a, I love this picture, He's dividing the Israelites out of the Egyptians. Because later on it'll say in verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land. And listen to this. And the waters were divided. Where do we have the waters divided before? Creation. In creation. Okay? He divided the land from the sea, the, 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 the light from the darkness. God is doing the same thing in the Israelites. He's doing a new thing. It's going to be called the Old Covenant. We shouldn't call it the Old Covenant, but that's what He's doing. He's doing a new thing and He's parting the the Israelites out of the Egyptians. He's taking them out because they can't stay with them anymore. They're already struggling with the desire to go back. He cannot work in them as a people of God if they stay there. He wants them to be their own people. His people. So that he worship, they worship him and he is their God. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground. They were being divided out by God. And of course the Egyptians pursued. Verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand. Again, I think God wanted the people to see this. Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots, and on their horsemen. God is telling Moses to do that so that he can destroy the Egyptians. He is putting them to death. What is the role of our king? Our Christ is our king. To protect us from all of his and our enemies. That hasn't changed from the Old Testament to the New. The pillar of cloud which I believe is the angel of the Lord, which is Christ, was there. And that's the one who was telling Moses what to do. He was the one speaking. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of Egypt, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus, Israel saw the great work, and that's key. They saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed, and the Lord believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So we do have some who did believe. We do have some who are probably just uttering, yes, I believe, because they were going along with the crowd. We'll see that later. But that's the key verse is that he brings about that Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done. Okay, and they feared the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. Yet this entire event is the picture, this, in this entire event, we see the picture of salvation in the Old Testament that's going to be referenced over and over and over throughout the, New Test, or the Old Testament and many times in the New. Now what is it that Paul comes back and says back in 1 Corinthians? He goes on and he says, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now why does he make these two events baptism? First, they were a form of baptism. Both the cloud and the sea are forms of the water, and the Israelites passed through both of them. Okay, Remember, a cloud is, it can be, uh, if if you're thinking about a normal cloud with lightning in it and everything, that's moisture. So that is, in a sense, baptism. Okay? This was, these two events were sacraments for the Israelite people because both of them pointed to what? Their salvation and deliverance. That's what a sacrament does. It points to the gospel and our deliverance. So these were baptism. This was a baptism, and we'll see the Lord's Supper next week. 
but baptism for the Israelites, showing the Corinthians, look, you're not that much different than those who perished in the wilderness. Calvin writes, Paul treats first of treats first of baptism and teaches that the cloud which protected the Israelites in the desert from the heat of the sun and directed their course and also their passage through the sea was to them as a baptism. Again, he'll speak of the same spiritual food next week that we have. And that what we are seeing here is that they were all baptized into the ministry of Moses by being under the cloud and going through the sea. This was a sacrament to them. Now, why is this important? Well, first off, what's a sacrament? Simply a sign and a seal of the promise of God concerning the gospel itself. That's what it is. Greg Bonson puts it this way. The sacraments are are confirmatory oaths that are added to the gospel promises. The sacraments ratify God's promise to us of salvation. Did he not promise to deliver the people out of Egypt? He did. And so as they're going through the water, that sacrament is showing the reality of that promise being made to them. The sacraments ratify to us the truthfulness of the gospel itself. So why does Paul bring this up? He does so because the Corinthians were banking on their baptism in such a way and their attendance to the Lord's Supper that they were banking on it in such a way that they thought that they were secure in how they were behaving and they were not behaving as they should have been. He's showing the Corinthians that they do not have some magical security because of their own baptism. It's like in some circles of evangelicalism, you ask a person if they're saved. And for years they used to say, yeah, I was baptism back in 1967 or something like that. at such and such church. In other words, their salvation isn't on their ba- is, is based on their baptism. It's not on their faith. It's not on them resting and trusting in Christ. Paul is showing them they don't have that security. And that those who thought they did have the security were scattered in the wilderness. That's verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. This was, there was a curse upon them because of their dis- disobedience and their unbelief. Matthew Henry writes, Many of those who were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea... That is, had their faith of his divine commission commission confirmed by these miracles were yet overthrown in the wilderness and never saw the promised land. Let none presume upon their great privileges or their profession profession of the truth. These will not secure heavenly happiness nor prevent judgments here on earth except the root of the matter be in us. In other words, our hope is in our faith. In Christ, a faith that is given to us as a gift. We should know that the sacraments themselves always do something. We're not just doing this as a memorial. We're not Zwinglians who see this as nothing but a mere memorial. We do say that something takes place in the sacraments. We do understand that. Our text in 1 Corinthians 11 will show us that, that they were drinking judgment upon themselves because of the manner by which they were observing the sacraments. Again, what were they doing? Being divisive. Drinking and getting drunk. Eating their food while others went hungry. Doing the very thing that they should not have been doing with the sacrament that represented so much more. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. And we can talk about that verse when we get to it more in detail. But you see, you get the idea. The same was true for the Israelites coming out of Egypt. They were not believing. They were being in disobedience. We'll find out that it gets much worse than that. That they were doing evil things and lusting after once. It says, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
That's not belief. That's not obedience. So the Corinthians were taking the sacraments in an unworthy manner. And Paul is working his way there. But he begins by showing them, look, even those who had sacraments of their own ended up dying in the wilderness. So therefore, flee idolatry. Turn away from it. This is why he says to them, do you not know that those who run the race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Keep coming back to that. Run the race in such a way that we may obtain it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder that you have worked through history to redeem a people to yourself and that you have given us the example in history of those who were faithful and those who were unfaithful. Lord, I pray that you'd fill us with the Spirit, that we would be faithful. But we also know that the one who is completely faithful is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in him that we trust. It's in your son's name we pray.